always focus on more established marketplaces where, you know, like Canada, UK, for example, oftentimes what will happen is I'll talk to people and get really excited because Amazon keeps contacting them and say, Hey, go to Turkey, go to UAE, go to whatever. Sometimes these new marketplaces, if Amazon's contacting you, it's because they're trying to figure out how to get just a base level of products there. Sometimes they open new marketplaces that don't even have PPC. Welcome to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we have an amazing guest that's going to be talking about the um, Convert More Clicks Summit that we have coming up that I actually get to be a part of. I'm so excited about that. Of course, I'm going to be talking about um, why bundles are awesome and why you should add them to um, your business strategy. Now, Kevin has been here before, so if you haven't heard him, I believe he's on episode 160 way back in the day, but he's done so many great things since then. And so we want to be able to talk about that. His level of expertise also not just hosting amazing summits for e-commerce sellers, but also um, he is very well versed and an expert in expanding globally and internationally with your Amazon business. So we will definitely touch on some of that if you're interested in expanding from whatever marketplace you're in. Most of us are in the US here, but if you've got UK or even Canada, Germany, other places, um, we're definitely going to touch on the best ways to try to expand from now to then. But again, you guys, don't forget that right before we talk to Kevin, which is just in a moment, we I want to remind you that brand new workshops have launched. I know a lot of you guys had some FOMO about the workshop that we just left and you wanted to be a part of it. Well, guess what? We're doing four more this year and they are ready for you to go view mommyincome.com slash workshop. Go check out all of the workshops you want to see. I'm coming to a city near you somehow someplace and yes for my california friends we are finally coming to california you're welcome so make sure that if you're in california you go get one of those spots before they fill up so let me tell you a little bit about kevin kevin has you know he's he's a family man he's e-commerce expert father husband and creator of expanding into um, global markets so kevin welcome to the show i'd love to uh, be able to just get started <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that uh, that introduction. It's uh, it's great to be back. Yes, and thank you again for coming back. Um my I know pleasure. that uh, you're a busy, busy person doing all these great things, including this summit, which let's just let's just open the floodgates and talk about the summit because I'm just over the moon excited about this summit. Yes, yes. So I, I'm super excited about the summit. And so basically February 1st to the 3rd, 2022. So as this uh, episode comes out, um, folks will have the ability to, if they, if they hear it beforehand, grab a ticket. Uh, we bought in or brought in some of the best experts from um, around the Amazon world to talk about basically just the general topic of driving sales and getting more traffic and making more conversions. So it's kind of a really wide umbrella when you think about it for the Amazon space uh, and going a little bit of off Amazon, but Primarily, we're focusing on Amazon and how you can make more sales on Amazon, whether you're, you know, wholesale bundler, private labeler, whatever the case is, you know, we just want you to make more sales and exactly. do better. And we all just want to make more sales, which equals more profit and more money in our pockets. So we're all, you know, it, it, it applies to everyone. And there are some super killer people coming on here to talk about multiple different strategies when it comes to converting more sales or bringing more traffic. You've got everything from people driving um, Facebook and Instagram ads to people that aren't using PPC and just naturally creating uh, amazing products via private label and all this stuff. But in the end, we want to sell more product. We want to have more traffic. And so the, you know, convert more click summit is going to be something that everybody is going to need in one way or another. So let's tell, tell us a little bit about your e-commerce background, because some people don't know you or have not listened to the old podcast, which they should go back and listen to, to be honest. But um, tell us a little bit about you and how you got into e-commerce. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back a little ways and I'll try not to bore people with uh, this life story, but it'll all kind of come together here. So I used to work in hotels way back when um, I worked in the convention center at a large hotel in Orlando. Uh, I was a manager doing events at uh, a, a famous mouse place in Orlando um, before that. And so uh, basically 
while working at this large hotel, we got bought out by an even bigger hotel company. And um, my level in the organization did not exist in the new structure. So basically what that meant was I was asked to walk the plank. Um, and so I think everyone was trying to do the right thing for me and, you know, try to help me find the right thing. But it was just like, it was time to find something rather than climbing that corporate ladder to go find something a little bit more entrepreneurial. And so I went to go work at a friend of mine's insurance agency uh, in Southeast Florida, where I live now, and they were doing really well. And it was one of those things like we hear the the term, you know, when you work for someone else, you're... Um, you're working really hard for their dreams. I was living that. And so I was friends with these people. So I was seeing, you know, and I'm happy for their success and they've done very well. Um, and I'm, I'm happy for that. But it was like, I need to go carve my own path. And that's how I got into um, e-commerce. I dabbled a little bit in retail arbitrage very quickly, realized I didn't like the treasure hunt. It was too much work, you know, scanning stuff. And people probably look at you like, what are you doing? Oh my <laughs> you know? gosh. I so many things like yeah the, the treasure hunt is great but like retail arbitrage is like oh like you said it's a it is a lot of work and it's a lot of not just just physical work not just mental mm -hmm. work i mean you have to go and physically gather your inventory and if we actually think about it not, i'm not a retail arbitrage hater as a matter of fact i did retail arbitrage for many years and it, it really boosted it, it got me started it got me motivated it got me making really good money the hard part is if you literally think about how people do business in this world right they don't you don't see target buyers going out to other stores and scooping product off their shelf and selling it in their stores i mean right we really i mean there's money to be made there and I'm a hustler so I understand like any anywhere you can make a dollar you should make a dollar right but the reality is if you want a sustainable business going out and scanning other people's stuff that they actually got for cheaper than you're buying it anyways and flipping it although there's pro profit for you there's more profit for you other places so learning that is like oh my gosh this is profitable but also not sustainable so uh, we digress right <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So you got to find sustainable models. So quickly realized that was not the model for me. Um, I wanted to dabble into a, a private label. And I decided, because this would have been summer of 2015 ish, while I was still doing kind of training and recruiting at that insurance agency. Um, on the side, I also had a side hustle, as I know you're a football fan, so you'll like this. I was a high school football official. So I took a season's worth of earnings, uh, blowing whistles and throwing yellow flags at uh, high school kids and <laughs> basically decided that literally to. It's like one of my dream jobs. <laughs> like, that would be so much fun to do that. Well, you could go to your local association. I'm sure, you know, in Michigan, there is a, uh, like probably the Michigan High School Activities Association probably has local chapters in your area where you could sign up. Um, yeah. If you want to talk more about it offline, I'd be more than happy. Oh, I don't do it so anymore, fun. but I did I it for 10 seasons. You, so that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, one of the things I learned very quickly was it doesn't matter if you're coming in with, you know, a couple thousand bucks or a million dollars in this business, everyone gets to a cash flow crunch at one point. And really what it comes down to in this business is you have two important components that I, this is the way I think of it. You have to have product to sell and people to sell to. Amazon.com gives you a lot of the people to sell to. You have to figure out first when you're starting out the um, what do I want to sell? But then from there, you have to figure out, okay, to scale, I either have to add more products to sell or I find more people to sell to. And so when you're bootstrapping, sometimes you got to start, okay, what are the other places I could sell to? Cause you start hitting a ceiling on the products you're selling. And so I started looking into, you know, selling on eBay. At the time, people were actually talking about selling on Sears.com. Like that was like a thing. Um, although they never approved me. That kind uh, of puts us away. Like we're OGs, right? So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm dating myself here. Sears, yeah. Like these guys are really old. <laughs> yeah. I'll give another date myself here. Um, while I still had the full-time job, I, you know, I had limited time between, you know, having a family and, you know, a full-time job and all this. Um, I would devote time to, you know, trying out, you know, different ways to sell. And I remember jet.com. That was something people were talking about for a while. Yes. This is before they got bought out by Walmart. Um, and then Walmart just kind of asked them like, okay, we learned what we need from jet and now let's move on. But jet.com was a thing. It was an e-commerce marketplace. They were trying to make it like the next Amazon. Um, 
I spent all this time because when you go into these other marketplaces, you got to learn their platform, their rules, what their customers expect, how to, you know, fulfill things. Cause it's not all FBA. You, you got to figure out all these different components. And I thought, Oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, but I maybe made like $500 after spending a couple months worth of the time I had to devote to the e-commerce business to devote to figuring out jet. And uh, it was like, yeah. fell flat. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Wah, right? wah, like, wah. Dang. But, what, but you know, I bet you learned a ton about what not to do. Right. And that's right. Still education. So mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. We learn a lot about what to do kind of the, you know, Socratic method, you know, when the doctor's talking to you, they're trying to eliminate what might not be the case of before they give you a, a diagnosis. And so one of the things I learned was working was selling in international marketplaces. So taking my products, offering them in Canada, offering them into the UK, going into the rest of um, Europe, going into um, Australia, tried Japan, didn't quite work out for me, but you know, going back to the whole Socratic method, some things work, some things don't. And so going into international marketplaces was because I understand how Amazon works. Um, really just the money symbol is a little bit different. I got to price it different for the marketplace. And it's just the hardest part was the hoops you had to jump through on the front end. Yes. Which so, I believe you figured out and then started teaching people. Am I right? Isn't that what your yes. talk might be about on the summit we're talking about? Yeah. So at the summit, I will be talking about how you can create your own um, international expansion. Um, just because I think so many people like want to sell internationally, but there's just something scary about like, oh my gosh, I'm going to send stuff across the border and like, you know, the customs officials are going to come to my door and like be mad at me and try to arrest me. And like, as long as you're not sending something like, you know, illegal across the border, which you're probably not selling on Amazon. So yes. you're probably, if you're selling it on Amazon, chances are you're probably fine. Maybe there's some sort of compliance thing you have to do, especially if you're selling something like supplements. But by and large, if people in the US are buying it, chances are someone in Canada is looking for it right now as we speak. And someone else is getting the sale over the course of the time you're listening to this that you could have gotten if you were offering your product there. I will tell you the feedback I've received from my audience when we start talking international is most of it, which I believe what you're teaching is going to clear the air for them because you're the expert here of the, the, a lot of the taxes and the money and the filing. And like, do I now own a business in the UK or Canada? And then do I have to pay their taxes? And of course, the other thing is the shipping. If they're saying, well, I've got my stuff in a U.S. warehouse, but now I have to pay to then ship that to the UK warehouse or some. I mean, Canada is a lot closer and I know Mexico is an option as well now too, which if you're stateside, that's at least proximity wise, a little bit closer than maybe going to Europe or other places. However, I'm worrying about like, okay, what I have to charge in the U S for this product, I would almost have to charge double other places. And is that above a price threshold that someone would want to pay in say Canada or the UK or something else? So I know that according to the feedback from the clients I've talked to, their number one fears really are about like legalities and ta taxes and things like that first and foremost. And then like, can I actually make money with all these extra expenses, you know, coming to and from, because a lot of people, they, they get their products from, you know, they're not always importing at this point. And so at this point you're becoming exporters. And then what is, what does all that look like? And most people just say, forget it. I'm not going there yet. That's too much to worry about. So maybe you can help a couple of pieces of information there to, to kind of like reel us in a little bit and it's not as scary as we think. Yeah, exactly. And some of that is just the fear of the unknown. And, you know, anytime you hear the word taxes, everyone gets real nervous. So my disclaimer here, I am not a tax professional. So don't go out and, you know, make tax decisions because some guy said something in a podcast because it's all way too complex for us to get into every little nuance of what might be. And reality is we don't know. So go talk to an appropriate tax person. Now, with that said, I want to arm you with some of the right questions to ask the appropriate tax person. I got my pen. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So here's one of the things that happens. So, well, let's take a step back. There's basically two buckets of taxes when you're selling internationally. There's sales tax, which you pay to whatever the local authorities are in that region you're selling, generally speaking. And then there would be income tax. So most of us, and we're in business, and if you don't have one, please pause this and go look for a CPA, be a real business owner, have a, a CPA to do your taxes. 
people will go to their CPA and say, Hey, I'm thinking about selling in Canada. Can you walk me through the taxes there? And they look at them funny. Like I don't do that. No. So I've had people almost in tears. Like I want to sell in Canada, but I can't cause my accountant doesn't want to deal with it. I'm like, okay, let's reframe the question. So if I, I'm going to the eye doctor later on today to pick up contact lenses. When they were checking out my prescription, um, if I had said, hey, I have a toothache, doc, can you do something about it? He'd say, no. And I would say, but, but you're a doctor. Why can't you do that? He'd say, but I'm an eye doctor. I trained for eyes. You can go to the dentist who's a doctor for teeth. And I would just go to the appropriate doctor. Well, it's the same thing with tax people. So your CPA or chartered accountant or wherever you live that does your income taxes, they're trained on the tax code for your filing, which is based on your profit, um, which will go to your, for the most part, depending on if you're living in a Western country, for the most part, your taxes will go to your local government. So for us, it's Uncle Sam. Even the profits you make in Canada or in Europe or Australia, those would all go to Uncle Sam, to the IRS. So the sales tax part, this is the part that scares people a lot too. Canada is nice because they do it very similarly to how we do it in the US, meaning it's added on top of the selling price. Now, don't want to get too deep in the weeds on it, but the simplest way to look at it is you got to register for uh, a business number in Canada and get what's called a GST, HST number and an import number. So basically they give you a nine digit number, kind of like an EIN in the US, and then you want to get the um, GST, HST, the goods and services tax and the harmonized sales tax, basically their sales tax as well as the import export accounts. And those numbers will help you get your stuff across the border. And then Amazon will be charging you um, or charging customer sales tax on top of the selling price, put that in your disbursements. And then you give that to the government at the end of the year, minus taking credits for things that you're going to be paying for over there. Anyway, they add sales tax on top of FBA fees and you're going to be paying GST at the border. That is all credits. So if you collect 5,000 from customers and you have 2,000 in credits, you owe the government 3,000 to keep it very simple. So your customers just paid you back for some of the stuff you would have been paying for anyway to sell over there. So that also that helps sound reduce like some of the costs. That's scary of a process. That sounds pretty normal. It's just like you said earlier, the fear of the unknown is what keeps us from moving forward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so if, so we'll, we'll go back to, you know, dating ourselves here uh, in the e commerce world. One of the first uh, signups I ever got was um, in the uh, for for software, I should say, was something called Tax Jar. Yes. And so at the time, nobody knew what to do with sales tax in the U.S. Like it was very vague what you're supposed to do. And I had registered in Texas. Um, now Texas, you have to say like for every transaction, the county, the city, the state. Um, if, if like, if they live in Houston, there might be like, you have to like the Houston school district and the, the, the mm -hmm. metro area trans like the bus system. So you might have five jurisdictions that so for one, it, so it was way <laughs> too much to figure out. Mm -hmm. And it was like all these lines of all these jurisdictions trying to calculate them on your own. So I ended up getting tax chart with Canada, as we record it now, there's like six lines. It's basically what were your sales? What did you collect? What was your, um, what was your, uh, what's your credits and what's the difference that you owe? I mean, it's pretty so much, it's, it's I'm oversimplifying bottom, it, bottom but it's lines. pretty much that. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. I think about that often with the, with the friends that live in California who have all of these different taxes for all these different things. And like it, depending mm -hmm. on the county and all the stuff, it's like all that. You just want to pull your hair out and be like, no, thanks. I'm just not selling in California. Yeah. <laughs> so so I like, totally understand that. I, I don't know how the government decides, okay, this money goes to Ontario and this money goes to um, Alberta or whatever the case is, but they just figure it out internally. Like they're just really nice. Maybe they've got kind of a kumbaya tax system of like, we'll just allocate it in a way that works for everyone. You know, yeah, like, I don't know. Probably. 
It's just they're, they're good like that in Canada, I guess. So let's go back to the question to ask, because when you were talking about your CPA and the eye doctor versus the dentist, like mm -hmm. what are the questions that we need to ask our CPA to whether know whether or not they know what they're doing or if we need to move on to somebody who is more qualified? Yes. So what you would do is say to them, OK, I'm going to be selling in Canada, so I'm going to provide you with sales reports uh, that will be in Canadian dollars. Now, most bookkeeping software uh, has a version that does multi-currency, whether it be zero or QuickBooks or whatever. But, you know, I've also given just reports, especially early on, to my um, accountant, and we just figured out a conversion rate. And then, you know, they figured out like, okay, these were your sales there, these are your uh, fees there. And so they, they use that to calculate what my profits were in the company. Because at the end of the day, like my sister is a principal in elementary school and I asked her one time. So if I was to say $1 in the US is how many dollars Canadian, um, say one to 1 1.3, for example. So therefore $20 US is how many Canadian dollars, what grade level would figure that out? And she goes, oh, that's sixth grade level math. And she explained like why it was like, you know, basic ratios and, you know, from a teacher level of like how they figure all that, like where, when to teach that. I'm like, oh, okay. So your CPA who's got probably a college degree in accounting is taking the CPA licensing from the accounting, whatever uh, organization that oversees them in that state. If they can't figure out sixth grade level math, you have the wrong account. Yes. That is super true. <laughs> yes. So I, in my account, I can almost guarantee, I don't know if I can guarantee, I will have a sinking suspicion. I'm his only client who has multiple currency uh, returns and he has zero problem figuring it. Right. Okay. He's kind so of intrigued by it, them. actually. Yeah. Asking them. And, you know, yeah, a lot of them like the challenge, right? Of like, yeah. okay, I have them. So having someone, if your CPA isn't quite qualified or you have someone saying, oh, yeah, we can definitely figure that out. Um, if not, asking the question about multi-currency, um, you know, global or multi-currency sales and yeah. um, who and how they distribute that. And, you know, working with somebody who is qualified to handle that is, you know, definitely something. And, you know, let's be real. And when we first start the first year or so, it's probably not going to be a lot of sales or still working out some of the kinks and so by then they can make you know if there's any mistakes to be made they can be made on a smaller level before you go all full into selling millions of dollars of products globally exactly and the good news is there's bookkeepers that know all this stuff that can you know uh, figure it all out for you figure it all out for your accountant because as you get bigger the more time your accountant spends on things oftentimes is a higher hourly rate than what your uh, bookkeeper would spend on it. So just something yeah. to think in mind too. But... Bookkeeping versus accounting versus all these different right. things. You know, your CPA has a higher level of education. They mm -hmm. probably don't work um, specifically with bookkeeping as well. They probably have a bookkeeper. My sister uh, works at an accounting firm. So she does a lot mm. of our e-commerce, you know, taxes and and all the stuff. But she she doesn't do the bookkeeping part. She's just mostly right. the payroll and tax expert. And um, somebody else does bookkeeping and they're good at that. So a good accounting firm someplace will have multiple people to help you let's not taxes be the reason that you don't sell internationally because really it's really about those products right finding the products that our international friends cannot get their hands on very easily locally and meeting mm -hmm. that need for them with the products that we have access to exactly exactly and going back to you know finding the right expert so a lot of people end up kind of doing Canada on their own. Now there are tax experts uh, like sales tax and more out of Rockwall, Texas, believe it or not, actually they're really good at Canada. Um, there's plenty of Canadian accountants that do, you know, the GST portion for you. Now, if you decide to go to Europe, I, I wouldn't recommend trying to do it by yourself. I kind of did it by myself and I realized there's a lot of landmines to step on there. Everyone I've talked to has kind of done it by themselves has ended up getting a local accountant. So it's not overly expensive, especially for the additional revenue that you'd be bringing in. Um, you could hire a company like Avask Accounting, A-V-A-S-K. They're in uh, Southampton, UK. Um, they do a great job and they are a sponsor of the upcoming um, 
uh, summit, but very. I thought sp- I was familiar with that name, and I yeah. was like, "Hey, that's one of the sponsors of the summit." Yeah, and speaking of summit, you guys, just so you're aware, we do have a link for the summit, which Kevin will be giving his full presentation on when it comes to this. And of course, you can hear wholesale bundle spiel from me, which you guys mm-hmm. have probably all already heard a million times. Um, but you know, a refresher is not bad. So again, um, maximizing e-commerce. For, uh, dot com forward slash mommy that's going to yes. get you your summit ticket and if you're listening to this after the fact um that link will redirect to another great place where you can get more information from kevin about all of this international stuff so mm-hmm. that was just my brief little commercial break for making sure you come to the summit because i'm going to the summit i'm going to be listening to all these other fantastic people which kind of brings me to like we're talking about international and we might get back as like a couple more questions about that but Go you know, going back to the summit one of the things I know, okay, let's just be real. We're, we're still in COVID times as much as we don't want to be mm-hmm. in a pandemic and whether uh, politically, emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever you care about COVID or don't, everyone's been affected differently, but we've all been affected. A lot of the gre- great resignation has brought a lot of people into in-home work and a lot of us are doing a lot of things from home. And sometimes uh, that's not always for everybody. A lot of people do like face-to-face conferences, you know, back in the day when we were all traveling all over the world to see all these people in person and things like that the beauty though of a summit is that number one you're in the comfort of your own space and you can kind of come and go you can eat your popcorn or drink your coffee in your pajamas and still get high quality education and that's really what this is i've likened this recently to um a college class for example we had a client came to us or a customer that said why before they made a purchase they said why don't you offer a money back guarantee for your or your course and i my my gracious and wonderful response is number one if you went to a university or a college and you took a college level course um, you pay your tuition up front you buy your materials and whether or not you show up to that class and learning anything is all up to you but you pay up front for education and the professor comes there and does their job and teaches you the material and gives you everything based on their expertise and at the end of the class if you don't like it you don't get to go there and say i want my tuition back I don't like this or this doesn't work for me. See, what you're actually paying for is somebody's 20 years or 30 years or 50 years of expertise and experience to teach you a class. So you actually attended a class and you like it, not like it or otherwise, you were educated in one form or another and that has value. And what I want you to understand about summits is that it's the same exact concept. You have all of these levels of expertise everywhere from, you know, 10 figure Amazon sellers who have really cracked the code to PPC to people like myself who have, you know, have vented a business model called wholesale bundles. And it's not always for everyone, but you're paying for years and years and years of somebody's expertise and level and how they built their business in that way. And the ticket's seven bucks. So if you don't want to pay $7 for some, what I would consider college level, uh, courses and classes that you're taking from these experts, um, that is a huge value to you. And it also should take time and place, right? So when it comes to summits, I think what we all know, right, is that people sign up for the summit, whether it's $7 or free or $7,000. Well, maybe that would cause people to show up a little bit more. But the reality is we want this summit, we want the idea, but then we don't make time for it. So let's talk a little bit about what people can do when it comes to the summit to be able to be fully immersed and focused on the speakers because we have a schedule to keep, right? Right, exactly. And we try to keep it uh, something that's uh, both an experience and then also something that's uh, convenient. So you can do it from the convenience of your home. You know, I personally love in-person events. I think people should attend as many in-person events as they possibly can, but there is an investment, not just in, you know, a couple thousand dollars for the ticket, the travel, the hotel, maybe three, $4,000, really when you start adding up all these things, uh, there's the time away from home, you know, to spend three, four days away, which can be a great investment of time, but you can only do that so many times. Whereas with a virtual summit, because this is virtual, you can do it, you know, I, I don't care what you wear when you're watching the summit. But one of the things that I like about the summit model is we bring together over 20, you know, experts um, on driving sales and converting um, uh, and converting more sales and converting that traffic that comes in, I should say, uh, is that 
we have that kind of scarcity of time because it's an event. And so you get the benefit of telling yourself, I'm invested in, you know, for a couple of days, you know, I'll watch when I, I can. And the nice thing is most of it is pre-recorded ahead of time. So it's not like you have to say, oh, well, if, if I'm not available at two o'clock, I'm going to miss that speaker. No, just each day I add in more content. And so uh, just each day you can go in, you can add it. And if you miss the stuff from the day before, it'll be there. And then if, when the summit's over, um, it's over, you know, little insider tip. You can upgrade to VIP to uh, to 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 keep the recordings because a lot of times I'm always made a much higher percentage of people than I think are going to purchase them end up uh, upgrading so that they can keep the recordings um, and then you could have lifetime access to that and the insider tip to that is the best deal is on the confirmation page immediately after buying the seven dollar um, general admission ticket. I'm telling you, this is what's so important to me is that those that cannot always come live and have a block of time to do, you know, three or two full days of education is that even in entrepreneurship, even as Amazon business owners, we need to be constantly educating ourselves on all of the things that can help us grow in our business. And this is like, for example, if you teach school, you know, there's always, you know, teachers are usually required to have a master's and then continually on-go education. So if you've been a teacher for 25 years, you're still taking ongoing education because there's new developments. There's new ways to teach and learn math. There's new um, developments in the, the um, education space that our teachers need to be aware of. And so even when you're liking that to education, there's not a willy-nilly schedule when it comes to that. They teach class at a specific time and date. And so making, I think it's so important to, especially with um, entrepreneurs, to be able to to have ongoing education because that one thing that you learn in one session of even one of these could change your business for life. I remember a summit that I went to that even in the first 15 minutes of someone's presentation, I learned something that was life-changing that I did not know before that. And the cost of the ticket at that time to get into that summit, I think was like, you know, $30 or something like that. But I'm like, I got $30 of value in the first 15 minutes and I probably could have not watched the rest, but then making the time and energy to educate yourself. That, so that means pulling out your calendar and making a commitment. If you cannot attend the summit the entire time with all of the different sessions going on, then block your calendar for the next Friday morning at, you know, between nine and 10 AM is your education time. And that's where you're going to class, right? You're going to go to class and you're going to, you know, bring your pen and your paper and you're going to take notes and you're going to educate yourself on how to have a bigger bottom line. You know, it's funny that recently um, someone, um, while I was at the workshop, one of the, my clients said to me, like, what is the single most important thing that has brought you success over all of this 20 years? And one of the things I said was education. I'm constantly learning new skills, learning and adapting to all the new things that are going on in e-commerce and even just being slightly aware. So I might not be selling on Walmart right this minute, but I'm going to sell on Walmart eventually. And so getting educated on how that process works is going to help me to eventually expand into Walmart, especially expand into international. So the, the, it's, education and learning. And we get caught in the weeds, do we not? We get caught in the weeds and we're just doing our business and we're selling product and doing all this and we don't make time for education. And then we wonder why we're not growing or that we're hitting a plateau. And so this is something that can change, make the difference between a plateau and actually growing and getting to the goals that you wanted to get to. Yeah, absolutely. And some of it is, like you said, it just takes one little golden nugget of information. It doesn't have to be you know, oh, I'm going to listen to all these and overwhelm myself with all these tasks that I, I, I think I should be doing. No, just pick one thing and follow up on it. And like, if you don't get at least a hundred or a thousand times um, the value of the $7 you invested into it, chances are then maybe you're not incorporating this into business. And so it doesn't matter if you're just starting out or, you know, you're a seven or eight figure seller you're going to find something that you could employ into your business to really take things to the next level. For, for certain. So what are, can I ask you this? What do you think you're, you're excited the most about, about a presentation or a specific speaker? Just, that's just a personal question, I guess. I know that there's someone that you can't wait to see that presentation and it's the, 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 your favorite one. Yeah. So that, that's the, that's the hard part is like, I, I, 
I, I don't want to say sit through, I get the opportunity to be there to record with the speakers for almost all the presentations. And so I learn a lot. I'm taking notes. Like I not just saying this because, you know, I'm on your show, but like, I'm taking notes from your presentation. And I'm like, I'm going to implement certain things by the Q4 of this year. So it's the beginning of this year. So we're still figuring out our goals. I'm like, I can see so much how wholesale bundling could fit into my uh, repertoire, so to speak. And so um, I, I've got, you know, someone else coming on that I'm recording with uh, later today as we're recording this where, you know, she's going to be talking a lot about conversions. And so I'm sure I'll get something very excited. I get something excited after almost all of them. And it's just because, you know, we're all learning. And so even though I've been doing this not quite as long as you have in the e-commerce world, but still I've been involved in this since 2015, as I mentioned. So, you know, I've picked up a lot along the way, but I, I feel like I always level up when I when I learn from other folks. And the nice thing is with a summit like this is you have so many wide variety of people to choose from. And the benefit over, you know, going in YouTube and like how to whatever is that sometimes when we've told ourselves I'm investing into this event and the speakers of this event, and I'm excited about the speakers of the event, I'm more likely to take that information and implement and take action on it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I love about it is that, you know, you get all of these experts grouping into one place and we don't have to do the traveling and going all over. And we also have ways to follow up and contact them and things like that. And if you can even learn one thing from that day to implement in your business that could change everything, you know, why not uh, increase your bottom line? So again, you guys, maximizing ecommerce.com uh, forward slash mommy, that's going to get you uh, into the um, the summit, you want to get your ticket. If you're listening to this after the fact, there's still visit that link because there's going to be educational resources and other things that you can do, do to uh, get the copy of that summit. Again, the summit is live and you can watch it during those times. But if you want the recordings because you can't commit to three full days of sitting uh, and watching and being educated, then you can have the copies of all of those or recordings that watch at your leisure. And I always encourage you make a schedule, make an education day, whether it's in your week or every other week or something to where say every you know every the first Friday of every month I have a three hour block that I use personally mm. to watch uh, other people's trainings other people's things to educate myself because I don't know everything I am the wholesale bundle queen and expert at that but I am not an expert at other things definitely not international or you guys have seen my friend Tim Jordan on here talking mm. about Walmart and those things and I learn more about importing and exporting for my friends at Fredos and all these other places so so, you know, we don't know everything about everything, but the more we know, the more we grow, the more our bottom line, my bottom line increases every time I watch a training that has a level that learning something new, it's always adding to your, your um, bottom line. So you guys make sure you go to maximizing ecommerce.com forward slash mommy, that's going to get your ticket and any final thoughts about expanding into international. I know one last question I have is like, is there anything that we should never do, you know, when we're talking about importing to other countries or, or adding international? What is the one thing you're like, do not ever do the following? So one of the things I will say is um, always focus on more established marketplaces where, you know, like Canada, UK, for example, oftentimes what will happen is I'll talk to people and get really excited because Amazon keeps contacting them and say, Hey, go to Turkey, go to UAE, go to whatever. Sometimes these new marketplaces, if Amazon's contacting you, it's because they're trying to figure out how to get just a base level of products there. Sometimes they open new marketplaces that don't even have PPC. So for private label sellers, especially PP, having PPC at your disposal is pretty important. And if the customers aren't used to using the platform in that country, it's probably not worth your time. Um, or, you know, some tools might say like, oh, you're gonna have really good sales in Mexico. Well, maybe it's just, they don't have enough data to come up with an accurate projection of what the, uh, um, the demand might be. Um, or Amazon will have like, one of the widgets when you log into Seller Central is oftentimes like, here's products with global sales. And it seems like it recommends Germany a lot and it doesn't always work out that well. Maybe it works great if you speak German and you understand the culture. But for those of us who are more English native speakers, it doesn't just, you know, you can't, it doesn't translate over quite as easily, especially if you don't understand the, the, the culture 
and whatnot. And so and stick with absolutely. English marketplaces first. That's a great point because even still, I actually had a couple of international um, students come to my workshop. And one of the mm. things that we discussed and understood was understanding the culture because the number one answer for, I, I tell people this up front when they come to my workshops, is like the answer all day long is going to be the customer. So if I ask you a question and you say the customer, you're going to be right. <laughs> um, and right. So just answer the customer every time. And what he was bringing to the table was the fact that he said, my problem sometimes with picking products for the U S market, because he is um, of, uh, he's originally from India is the fact that he's like, I'm still trying to understand the culture and what the buyers need mm. before I can meet a need with their, with their, um, with a product. I need to understand what is it that people need and data only goes so far. You actually have to be aware. And mm -hmm. so I think that was an excellent point because, you know, if you have been to Germany, for example, or you're of German descent, or you understand that, or maybe you've done, you know, lived in multiple places, that is an advantage for you to understand the culture and what they buy and how they use Use their products and who, what, when, where, why, and how, because it is different in every location, every culture, everything. So the advice, I guess, is starting with things you're a little bit more familiar with, with marketplaces that have been open a lot longer. So your Canada, probably UK, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. And then what, is, what would be another third market you think is? is uh, maybe safer. then dab into uh, to Germany. Germany's a higher level of complexity. Australia, the sales aren't necessarily huge, but it's pretty easy to get into, but as far as timing, if you, if you have limited amount of time, I would go Canada first and then level up because it's a little bit more challenging to go across the pond to the UK just because VAT's more complex than uh, GST. So you want help there and you want to price things differently because their prices include the value added tax. And then maybe go to Australia, which is pretty simple. Like you don't, most people don't even need to register for anything over there, especially starting out. And then maybe go into mainland Europe, which is a little bit more challenging after Brexit. So that, that would be kind of my path, I would suggest to people. Awesome. Well, that's definitely enough for people to get started. And can you let everyone know, um, of course, besides the summit, which we all want everyone to mm -hmm. come to, um, but if they don't come to the summit, how can they get in touch with you and where can they find you to learn all about what you're doing? Yeah. So, uh, appreciate that. So I've got, uh, podcasts and YouTube channel of my own maximizing e-commerce. So if you go to youtube.com forward slash maximizing e-commerce, all one word, no dashes, um, as well as you could always feel free to email me. If you have questions, Kevin at maximizing e-commerce.com. I do have services to help people launch into, uh, international marketplaces. Cause sometimes it can be difficult doing it on your own. Um, and then all just go to maximizing ecommerce.com forward slash mommy. And if you are listening to this before the end of the summit, then great. You can get um, a ticket and check out my presentation there. And then also if it's after the fact, you can at least uh, get some resources for international expansion. Awesome. Well, Kevin, again, thank you for coming back to the show and helping us a little bit more with this. I'm really excited about the summit and the education there. Um, I've got my, um, you know, basically my materials and snacks ready to be able to jump in the summit, which is actually tomorrow. So for you guys that are kind of listening to this in the moment, literally do not sleep on this. You're going to get a top level education. And again, you don't have to watch every single one right in these next couple of days. Um, you can get the VIP package that will help you to just save all of the and then put them on your calendar. Because honestly, if you attend nothing else the rest of this year, it's going to give you over 20 presentations. And that's enough material to do what? Twice a month for pretty much the rest of the year, you know, two, a couple different hours of education. And by the end of this year, Absolutely. even if you want to do two a month um, for, for the price you're going to pay for that is just top notch education. So again, Kevin, thank you so much for being part of this. You guys, I know that you could be anywhere else in the world doing any other thing, listening to any other person. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. We'll see you same time, same place next week.